Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, everybody, and I'm really glad to be here, and I want to thank the committee for inviting me and making this such a pleasant event. We've really had a great time here, and and I want to welcome you if you are new to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's great to see a lot of people in their first year of sobriety, and I want to welcome you, and I certainly want to welcome all those who have come before me uh, and who are here to, uh, to, to continue to carry the message to me and many others. And... Um, If you are new, I want to tell you the three most important things in my life which have made it possible for me to stay sober one day at a time for a period, long period of time, because I've tried it without these three things, and I didn't stay sober, and with them I have, so it's like I know what does and what doesn't work. I don't have to keep experimenting with that. And that is a sobriety day to home group and a sponsor. We have the triangle in Alcoholics Anonymous of recovery, unity, and service, and I try and apply that in my life. And in addition to that, for me, is this, addition, is this triangle of recovery, a sobriety data home group, and a sponsor. And to tell you just a little bit about each one of those, my sobriety date is February the 8th, 1976, which means I've been sober over 27 years. Now, that's not to... Uh, I'm so grateful I got sober in a time when there was Alcoholics Anonymous around. And I was never told, ever, I was too young to be an alcoholic. When I meant business, they knew I meant business. And I've been able to stay here because there is no age limit or minimum. Uh, There's no minimum or maximum of drinking. And and I'm I'm grateful for that. I've never seen us question anyone coming into the doors, how much did you drink? And we tell they tell us, they say, ooh, you're court short. You know, we've never uh, (laughs) we've never had that qualification, thank goodness. And so, uh, but now that isn't my first sobriety date, but it is my last one, and it will stay my last one as I as, as long as I continue to do the daily maintenance. What's the daily maintenance? Well, some of those things are one day at a time. I don't take the first drink or anything else that affects me from the neck up. I start and close my day with prayer, and I chat with God throughout the day as well. I try to be of service. I don't screen my phone calls. Uh, I try to uh, be of help wherever I'm asked to be, show up for my commitments, try to set about my day so I don't have to end up making amends to anybody later on. Those are the kinds of things that I do, just a few of the things that I try to have that daily maintenance in, but the main thing is that contact with a power greater than myself. That is what will keep me away from the first drink and protect me from myself. My physical sobriety is extremely important to me. It is important that I keep it in place 24-7. I don't play games with it. I don't put it in gray areas. So for me, that means I don't drink near beer. Okay, I don't smoke near pot. Um, I don't take health store speed. Okay, um, I don't do any of those sort of pseudo kind of looks like it things. Okay, because I'm in it for the effect. I've always been in it for the effect. And when you sort of kind of might get something, or your mind says you should be getting something. And it's not, that is more frustrating than anything. And you will go where you will get the effect. And so for me, it's a very black and white thing. But I also know in my case that the not drinking is the starting point. If I thought that's all I was going to get out of this thing, which is what I originally thought, I mean, how I would have shortchanged my life. How I would have, in my view for my life, missed what the program was about, which is a way of living. I have the impression that if you just quit drinking this day, everything's just going to get wonderful. Because I had non-alcoholics ask me questions like, um, why do you always have to get drunk? Or, why, why can't you have a couple like we do? And I know those were very sincere questions. And, and they were good questions. Um, but what I didn't know, too, is that I answered them in the most honest way I knew before I had any education about alcoholism. And that was, I don't know. 
I've always drank to get drunk. Always have. It was always the purpose of any evening was to get drunk. So by them asking those questions, I get the impression that the absence of alcohol and drugs, then everything's just going to get wonderful. And when I did that, I ended up drinking again because I hadn't been drinking. And I know what you know what that means because I don't, I can clean up the outside very easily, but it's the inside that was empty and still a mess and still confused. And the only thing I knew to get rid of that was drinking. And a little while later, I did it again. And it wasn't until that I came into this program and began to take a set of steps that we talked about tonight. And I was reading how it works. That is how it works. There is only one path. That is the path, those 12 steps. Until I took those, my life did not change. It may have looked better on the outside, but it did not change on the inside. So that's when the recovery program really began to come into my life, is when I began to take those steps. So physical sobriety needs to be in place 24-7 for me in order for anything in the rest of this program to work out or to be able to take an effect in my life. So if you are new here tonight and you don't have a sobriety date, really encourage you to get one of those. It, it, Alcoholics Anonymous just makes a lot more sense when you're sober. So good, just, just a suggestion, okay? Uh, a home group. I have lived in four distinct areas of the country. For me, that means I've also had four different home groups, and that's the only reason to this moment in 27 years that I've changed home groups is because I have literally moved out of the area or state. But when I moved to Northern California, what I also realized is I've also had four different last names, okay? So <laughs> just kind of worked out that way, you know. Um, all sober uh, last names, but uh, and nope, not running from the law or geographics. They just, it was just how it worked out. And... And uh, and my current, I'll tell you about those on the way, but uh, my current home group is the um, Dublin in Dublin. It's the primary purpose group, meets on Thursday nights, 8 o'clock. Y'all are welcome. And a home group has taught me how to live out there on those city streets. A home group, just, again, a couple of things of the many that it has taught me is about courtesy and consideration of other people. I knew zero about that. The, the mirror was always in front of my face, always looking at myself. I didn't know the first thing about being considerate of you or the people around me. Uh, you taught me that right from the gate. Uh, you know, getting to the meetings on time, don't getting up, running around, making a scene, making an entrance, making an exit. You know, we always do these kinds of big drama things. At least I did. And you taught me about how to just be quiet and be one among many. I do, I'm not a big deal, never have been, never will be. Don't draw attention to myself in those kind of negative ways. Just be one among many. One of the workers here. Get a commitment. Make that you, you know how to be a taker. Why don't you start learning how to give back without recognition? Just be one among many to make that meeting get going. You taught me how to be a better daughter here. I was an only, am an only child, um, and when I got sober, I uh, we all lived in three different states, and um, I made those amends, and it was about another 14 years that I would, I mean, I would t call my parents about twice a year, make sure that we all still had the same address and phone number, and that was kind of the relationship. At about 14 years of sobriety, I thought, you know what, I am their only daughter. And I think it's important that I develop a relationship with this family. It's not about what's going to be coming back this way. It's about what am I putting out that way. And I called them on the first Sunday in January of 1991, um, and I said, I'm going to call you the first Sunday of every month, and I haven't missed that commitment over 12 and a half years. Now, that doesn't make me wonderful. It just means that I made a commitment. You told me, do what you say you're going to do. And so I had to make sure that whatever I said to them would be something that wouldn't just happen for a couple of times and then drop off. And, and to ensure that, I have a little sticky note I move from month to month, okay? I don't have it locked up in here. My life gets going at 180 miles an hour. I have a little sticky note that once I'm done with that Sunday of calls, I move it to the next month so I don't forget. So, again, I protect me from, from me because that's an important commitment to me. And what I didn't expect out of that came about six months into it, I started getting responses, unsolicited responses from the, my family members. I, I knew you'd call today. I thought I'd wait around till you called. Um, yeah, I knew it was the first Sunday of the month. I knew you'd be calling today. The I love yous that were unsolicited, that really weren't that common. Not that I was looking for those, but the relationship that we got to develop. 
And so you taught me that because I listened to how you repair your family relationships so I could apply something in my life. You taught me how to be a better employee because my added, my drinking uh, work behavior was all I really had, and that was you showed up when it was convenient. You know, that wasn't very often. And um, he said, no, we, we go every day. If they expect us every day, we go every day. And, and that was like a new concept to me. And I would show up, and I would take Tradition 1 into the workplace that the common welfare of this company comes first before me and my little whims and whines. And by doing that, I get to be a part of something instead of separating myself from. I'm on the team, and I get to be a part of that. You taught me how to be a friend. I just knew how to use people. I, I was a loner. It's very easy for me to be alone, self-sufficient, in, independent. But every now and then I might need something, and that's when you would hear from me. And I was a scorekeeper, whether it be with family or friends, and you taught me how to get rid of that thing. Because I don't know, for some reason it felt like it one day it was going to be important for me to remind you of all the wonderful good things I'd done for you. I don't know. And I'll tell you what a freedom it was to get rid of that. Because to be kind and loving is how I want to be on a regular basis, not an infrequent basis that i got to keep track of. And so you taught me how to get rid of that scorecard and just free up. Just free my life of that kind of bondage of keeping score. And so those are just a few things. You've taught me how to stay in a home group meeting when I don't want to, when it is very difficult, when the personalities are there. I've had those four different home groups, and every one of them has had something in common. There's always been a couple of people that I know would be happier in another home group. <laughs> I just know these things. <laughs> of course, they often don't go anywhere. Sometimes they do, and it's like, see, I knew. I knew this. But the problem is, is I had to remember, hey, I'm the one who moved to these different cities, you know. It's just a different set of people's names, that's all. And you've taught me how to just stay with it and that the history of the group becomes very important to me. Instead, because pretty soon, you know what happens is, is you run out of home groups because those all, they all have a couple of personalities that I don't particularly care for. And then every time I think that about somebody, i got to think, I bet there's some people in here who would like me to, to get another home group too. So, you know, I'm not everybody's darling. And i got to remember that whatever I'm thinking about them, people are probably thinking about me. And so we just learn how to sit here. I've been, in, I've been in the rooms where it's been me, my ex, the ex he, and the new she, okay? That's awkward sometimes. Um, you know, nobody gets custody of the meeting, okay? It's not easy sitting in those rooms. But I'll tell you what it makes me do. My guideline was always, if I knew what either one of them were doing or saying, I'm not doing my job. My job is to work the room. My job, you know how rooms always tilt towards, they got kind of a tilt toward the back because that's where all the newcomers kind of rolled to? <laughs> if I'm not back there working the room, then I'm not doing my job because as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I only have one purpose, and that's to carry the message, to let someone new who doesn't know there's a way out that there's a way out. And I am here not to look for the next job or the next him or the next her or the next place to live. I'm here solely as for with one purpose is to carry my message, what message I have of my experience, strength, and hope to the new one. So that's what it made me do was work the rooms a little bit harder than I already was. So just a couple of things that a home group has done. And a, that third thing is a sponsor. I've, I, uh, I've had three sponsors in sobriety, uh, one in Minneapolis, one in Atlanta, and one in Southern California who I've continued to have. We've had an over 16 and a half year relationship. It's a fantastic relationship. All three of the people I've asked to be my sponsor had many things in common. I want what they have. It was said earlier today. And this, these people all have a light in their eyes. They have a a solidity about them. They're standing still in their own skin. And they have a relationship with the God of their understanding. None of my sponsors and I have the, a similar drinking story. Not even remotely close. 
I don't need anybody I can swap bad stories with, okay? I want someone who's out there living this as a way of life who can show me how to do it. I don't need to top anybody on stories. But I want to know how to live a different way of life, and I love the way you are. How do you do that? That's how, who I've asked to be my sponsor. Show me how to live. Um, that person is somebody for me that I can trust 110% that I'm willing to take that kind of a relationship to. It's the one person who knows all about me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the beauty marks and the warts. I need to have that one person in my life who do, I do not have any secrets from. Because I start keeping one secret and it gets easier to keep two. And then pretty soon I'm not going to bother her with this. And let me tell you, I need a sponsor, want a sponsor, love having a sponsor in my life as much today as ever, if not more so. The, re the, the desire for the relationship continues to grow. So those three things, if you are new or you're sitting in this meeting restless, irritable, and discontent, and you'd like your life to be different, and you don't have one or all three of these things active in your life, a sobriety date that's honest, a home group you're an active in the middle member of, and a sponsor that you actively work with, I invite you to get them in your life. Because I will guarantee you that your life will change. With that umbrella, this is where the steps, working with others, studying the big book, all comes into play when I had those three in place. But I certainly wasn't shooting for that when I took my first drink. I wasn't interested, didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous problem drinking or anything like that. But on a Friday the 13th in April of 1970, a little 12-year-old girl took a drink of alcohol. I'd been invited earlier in the week by the cool kids in school, and I couldn't wait to go. And I'd heard them talk about drinking, and I, uh, Friday morning, made the decision, I'm going to get drunk tonight. I have never seen anyone drunk. I would be the first person I saw drunk. My, uh, the, it simply was just to be, you know, accepted by the cool kids in school that I wanted to hang out with. I wasn't running away from a horrible home life, abuse, violence, none, none of that of any kind. I came, I, the, the little girl that took that first drink had kind and loving parents. I've never, the, the, you know, never seen the car driven up on the lawn. Uh, nobody dancing on the table with lampshades. Uh, I've never seen abusive drinking. Didn't even hear people talk about that kind of drinking. Uh, people who had me in Catholic school, Catholic church, I had a very kind and loving God in my life. Even when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I just felt that I had abused the privilege of asking for help because I was such a deal maker out there from the time I took that first drink. I had... Um, I've never seen a violence or abuse of any kind of any nature. I was, it was totally foreign to me. The first time I heard about stuff like that was when I came into AA and heard your stories. I never was totally unfamiliar. There was, uh, I didn't feel inferior. I didn't feel superior. I just wanted to be able to kind of have the approval of those kids to hang out with them. And I uh, arrived at that party that night at 6 o'clock, and it was as if yesterday. I remember that day, it was, we were, they were passing around a bottle in a brown bag, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it was. And I couldn't wait till it got to me, and I watched what they did because I wanted to do the right thing. And it got to me, and I did that. I took a pull off of that bottle, and it passed it to the next guy. And like Craig was talking about, it just burned up my throat, but I didn't remember saying, oh, ick, I remember thinking, all right, you know, just destroying your throat, but this is good, this is good. <laughs> And a few moments later, it did that magic for the first time for me. It just went, the only analogy I can think of for myself is that it was just like hot lava. It was warm, it was quiet, it was thick, it flowed and filled in every hole in my gut, and I didn't know I had any. But what happened is my shoulders relaxed. And I, I'm like, I love this. This is great. You know, two inches behind my belly button where I really live, there is this warm glow. And I'm 12 years old thinking, you know what, oatmeal has never done this for me. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what's in there, but I know I want some more. And it came around the second time, and because I wanted the exact same effect, I did the exact same action. And it got to me, and I took a pull off of that bottle. I gave it to the next guy, burned my throat going down, did that magic again. 
But if there is a line that we cross, we hear about the invisible line. I crossed it between drink number one and drink number two. Because what happened up here, I'm still feeling that anxiety. Well, that anxiety, when it hit the second time, turned into arrogance. And what happened is then I threw my shoulders back internally, and I thought to myself, hey, aren't they glad I'm here? You know, <laughs> I went from drink number one, please accept me, to drink number two. Who needs you? I know I was three months sober when I first heard Clancy talk about that almost instant change of perception. And I'm sitting in that room thinking, yes, that was drink number two. I no longer needed you, your approval, or anything else. I moved into another world that I never did, returned to the one I left, and I loved this new world. And that night I didn't know I would set up some regular patterns for me, which was I would drink as much as I could, as fast as I could, whatever I could, whenever I could. I blacked out that night. I passed out that night. I came to with my first case of the dry heaves. And all that happened in a three-hour period of time. I came to with those dry heaves, wanting to go back to the party they drugged me away from because I'd had a good time. I don't know much what happened, but I knew I'd gotten drunk and I'd achieved it, and I couldn't wait to do it again. They wouldn't take me back. And I started already planning for the next day. I don't know if I was born an alcoholic, and that's as much time as I spend thinking about that. It is not important. I don't come from a long line of alcoholics. There is no identified alcoholism in my family. We have a suspect uncle, okay? <laughs> He's still under suspect, though. But parents aren't, grandparents aren't. We, I don't know where I got it. And the, I, I don't know if I was born with it. The behaviors I did before I took a drink were, were, you know, I didn't do lying, stealing, cheating, abusing people before I drank, okay? But I sure did do them on the natch afterwards. When I took a drink, I activated this disease of alcoholism. My life, my thinking, my feelings, my behavior, everything changed starting that day. I woke up that morning, that Friday morning, and on the top of my list had been the same things. Be a good daughter, be a good student, obey the rules, stay out of trouble. I am a conformist. I'm not a rebel or radical by any means. If you say go down here and turn right, I will. I will not question you're telling me the wrong direction. Come Saturday morning, however, what I woke up thinking about was drinking and how am I going to get it and who's going to buy it and where am I going to drink it and all those good ideals were in the spot number two. And eventually they were removed from the list because I can't do them, but I woke up thinking about drinking every morning for the next six years. I activated the mental obsession. It was so overwhelming. The other thing I activated was the physical craving. When I, I didn't know that when I take a drink, I take a drunk. I mean, I always drank to get drunk, even from the first night never having taken a drink. I drank to get drunk. I didn't think anything odd or unusual about that at all. My behavior that night was my first and only experience. I assumed everyone had the same experience. So it didn't seem odd or unusual to me. And yet when I came in here to you, you explained to me that is not normal drinking. To me, it was. And so that are, those are some of the symptoms that I activated here in this disease, and it took me on a fast route. A year later, I'm introduced to the wonderful world of drugs, which I needed to be. I needed these accessories in my life, okay? I love to drink, and I drink whiskey, just like Hector. I love whiskey. It just happened to be the thing that I would like, whiskey and a beer chaser. That's what I do at 13 years old. Don't think anything odd or unusual about that at all, except I do black out a little too quickly. And um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I, want, I don't want to be sleeping through life. I don't want to know what's not, not know what's going on, so I find things to help keep me awake. To, to help me drink longer, which is the whole point of any evening, any drinking event. And uh, I found things like speed and acid will help you. 
And uh, they really work. I mean, they, they do. Uh, they help you. You see truth in multicolors. Um, and I'll tell you what, it got me here to you a lot faster than I intended to get here. So it just was the accelerator for me, and it was hand in hand. It wasn't anything odd or unusual to begin to incorporate into my life whatsoever in the last year and a half of my daily drinking. I'm 16 and 17 years old, and my diet is whiskey and acid. That is my diet. I don't think anything of it. It's as normal as breakfast and lunch to me. My, my, my father didn't quite see it that way, but um, to me, that was a daily way of life. And I was able to do things. I was able to have a little jobs going on. I always needed the jobs, and I was able to maintain that little bit. And I, I lived such a double life. I would be on the, the uh, my senior year of high school, I'm on the pom-pom squad, and, and I I really did entertain, you know. Uh, I'm loaded and ripped to the max, and uh, the only one that smiled on the football field, you know. And uh, the teacher would point me out, you know, she's the only one who smiles. The girls are all saying, yeah, she's loaded. That's why, you know. <laughs> we didn't tell the teacher that, but I did have that secret advantage. Uh, when I... Um, was 17 and a half years old one more time my life is going to change on a Friday and what happened is that I had uh, been expelled from my senior year of high school six weeks before I'm supposed to graduate didn't bother me any bothered my dad a lot didn't bother me a bit who needs an education you know I don't have any plans dreams goals skills you know so what my big dream is the next party. That's as little teeny tiny as my life was. It was just living to the next party and living from the last one. That's as big as my world got. Well, after I had been expelled and ca caused a great deal more trouble, my father didn't know anything about alcoholism, and, and, and he had tried all human power to relieve me of my alcoholism, and he sought professional advice. They said, while you still have legal, legal custody, you need to commit her to a treatment center for alcoholism and drug addiction. And that's what he did. In May of 1975, I was committed to a hospital in a little town called Grand Forks, North Dakota, um, and I would be introduced to you for the very first time. I'd never heard the word alcoholism. I'd never heard the word sobriety. I'd never heard about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd, I'd, I'd hear you say, if you want what we have, and I'm like, I, I, I don't. I mean, y'all don't drink. <laughs> Why? Why would I want that? I mean, it's not a problem. Seems to be to most everybody else in my life, but it is not a problem to me. Why would I seek you out for a non-existent problem? And so I just knew, though, because of this commitment that I can't really leave here. If I do, they'll find me, and so let's just get, get this done. Let's just get this out of the way, be good. It's just a kind of a short period of time thing. You can do this, then you can just kind of vanish from life and get back to your regular life, which is drink every day, because that's all I wanted to do. I would be taken, we would be all taken to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and of course, I'd sit in the back row because you don't want to get alcoholism when you're here. And <laughs> I'd sit in the back row because there's, you know, why not? And I would distract myself while they were doing exactly what I'm doing tonight, sharing their experience, strength, and hope, and hope that I might. You know, here's something to identify with and, and answer some questions that maybe I had. I don't have any questions because I'm not interested in what you're offering. But every now and then I would tune in and I would rationalize what I would hear you say just so I could prove to me my case is different. I'm not one of you. And I would hear you say things like, um, I lost my family because of drinking. My thinking says, I, I want to lose my family. Do, I, do you know how lucky you are? You, know, you can have mine. Okay? And down here where I really live, that two inches behind my belly button, the, the thing I knew was is I had, it had been necessary for me to leave their home because they no longer had a safe place to come home to. I know, I identified in our book about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I'm the Mr. Hyde not drinking. That's when the rage comes out. That's when the confusion and the restlessness comes out. And I am definitely the nicer Dr. Jekyll when I'm drinking. The world could fall apart, and it's okay. So I know, even before they're telling me, I know I have these personality swings. I just don't understand them. And I know that drinking always makes my life better, and I can breathe deeper. But I don't know it really until they start talking about stuff like that. Talk about totaling out cars. I have never totaled out a car officially, okay? <laughs> 
you know how we are. If it wasn't the same make and model, it doesn't apply, right? Um, I had a little drunk car that arrived here, though. You know, when you buy them, they start off square, okay? And then uh, they get rounded out with the drunk bumps and things and stuff's falling off. And in addition, my car, um, the window had been shot out of it. And my gas cap was a mitten I had stuck in there, okay? <laughs> Just too busy for details. And... Uh, <laughs> But I'd never in my life, you know, totaled out a car. So that was my, my idea of it. And uh, they talked about drunk driving charges. I had two girlfriends that were mirrors of me. We drank and used drugs exactly like each other. I'm happy to report that one of them has chosen to go out and is still experimenting. At 20 years later, the other one re ended up returning to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's 12 years sober down in Southern California. And we ran into each other in a meeting. And neither of us had ever lived in, so in Southern California together. We, we drank in North Dakota together. And here we are in, in Alcoholics Anonymous in Southern California together. It's a wonderful reunion. And, um, but I was the designated drunken driver of our group. <laughs> they couldn't drive sober, let alone drunk. So naturally it was up to me. And because I had the advantage, I worked for the city police, or the city judge, actually. And so I knew all the police. They knew me when they would stop us for what they perceived was drunk driving. Uh, they would stop us, take away our booze, and tell us to go home. And so I didn't have any drunk driving charges. And they talked about losing jobs. And I told you I had always had a little series of little jobs going on. I needed the money. I wasn't smart enough to support myself any other way. And so I had these little jobs going on. And uh, I guess in the effort to be a good employee, um, in blackouts, I would quit, okay? Well, that's fine, except I don't know I've quit. And uh, I show up next day, you know, uh, to everyone's surprise, including mine. And it's just, you know, so awkward, these things. Just, just... And so that's, those are the things that I could rationalize away, but in my own small way could begin to identify. And then you talked about a couple of things that really bothered me. You talked about all those broken promises. I remember sitting in the back of that room thinking, how do they know about those? Like you had just uncovered something very private. And you knew about those because that's what you had done. And I realized I hadn't been able to keep a promise since I was 12 years old and took a first drink because I cannot, I am powerless over alcohol and I don't know that. Regardless of how sincere I am and how much I want to please someone or, or do the right thing, I am powerless over alcohol, and I can keep that promise for almost two weeks. It's that second Friday that gets me every time, you know. I could make it through the first weekend, but it's a downhill from there, and that second Friday comes around, and I have no recollection. It's almost like a whiteout of where, what I said, what I promised. I am so overcome with the, with the power of needing a drink. And the other thing, there was a woman who tried to, who talked about scrubbing away the smell. And what scared me is that I sat in the back of that room thinking, you know what, I know that she knows what the smell smells like. She said that was booze coming through her pores and that she was an alcoholic and she doesn't drink anymore. And I thought, oh, my God, if I'm not careful, I might be one of those people. And that's as close as I got to admitting the possibility of a potential problem. I was sent to an all-women's halfway house in, in uh, Minneapolis, and I don't like women, so that's where they thought that would be a really good idea. I went to live with 40 of them. It was not a good idea. It did not break me of my dislike for women at that time. But it gave me another little safe haven, and uh, I went. I did the bare minimum. This is my first memory of doing the bare minimum, and that will not work for me. And that was don't drink, don't take any drugs, and go to one Alcoholics Anonymous meeting a month. <laughs> Okay, you're not going to get two out of me, but I'll go to one. And I was too stupid to sign my own court card and go to the movies, you know, my own thing. So I went to those meetings. And I went and I would, of course, as the meeting started, I walk in. As the meeting was over, I walked out. I wasn't interested in getting to know any of you because I'm just visiting anyway. You know, I'm not sticking around. I'm really not an alcoholic. And I uh, did that for seven months. I came to Northern California to visit my mother. It was in San Jose. I was there two and a half weeks. First week, I'm hanging around with the people I used to drink with. The last week and a half, I'm drunk and loaded with them. No surprise. But what happened is I got my definition of it quit working because I would hear this and I would, and I would think of 
well, gosh, I'm sorry I quit working for you guys. It's still working great for me. You know, that's why I know I don't want what you have. You see, I, I didn't look at any of the prices, the penalties. They just weren't existing in my mind as prices or penalties. A little inconvenient sometimes. And yes, I don't like looking at the hurt faces of my family and the disappointments one more time. But I just had shut down at 12 years old emotionally to not care about anything anymore. So it really did not penetrate that deep into my life. But I got my idea that it quit working because I could be physically drunk and unable to get off the floor that I'm face down on. That's not the problem. The problem is I can't shut my mind off. When I am conscious, I can't shut it off, and all it is is thinking about you. That first drink gets you drunk. I don't want to hear about all your cliches and your slogans, and yet that's all that's coming in. It was just a nightmare within, my, within myself. I came back to Minneapolis. I stepped my meetings up from one a month to one a week. Sounded like a lot of meetings to me when you're still running your own life, just thinking just, it's just about not drinking and going to those meetings, right? Five weeks later, on a Friday, I get a letter in the mail with one joint. And like any still uncommitted alcoholic, I decided to keep it because you, know, you just never know when you might need something like this. <laughs> it was amazing I needed it the next day, you know. <laughs> um, the timing, just, it's just unbelievable. Just, yeah, right, right. I didn't think about anything but that stupid joint. <laughs> And I wasn't even a fan of pot, but it was there. And that's why I know some things about me. I choose not to have alcohol or social drugs for those potential visitors that may want something. I know me. I know my mind gets a set of bad emotions going on and a rough day on the freeway or something like that. I'm going to come home and visit myself. You know, I'm going to check this stuff out, and I'm going to, you know, dig into it, see if it's still good anymore. You know, I have to protect me from me so much. And so that's why I don't, we, we choose not to have anything like that in our home, and all of our friends are non, you know, non-drinkers anyway. So this is the way I, I have to, I choose to do it. How you do it is, is of course, your choices. But because it was there, I smoked that one joint, and that was on the 7th of February in that is the last thing that I've had to this moment, mood altering. I didn't know it was going to be the last thing I was going to have. If so, I might have thought of something else. It was just going to be one more lie, one more secret that they didn't need to know. It was just going to be one more dishonesty in my life. And you see, it was the biggest one I knew. And what has happened is I, I surrendered for the first time, and to me, the again, the only analogy I can think of is even though I had thought I had surrendered and given up and wanted to do this thing, it was at that moment that I felt like that flat line on that heart monitor. I am so done. You see, I forgot I was only 18 years old for the first time. I didn't have the excuse, but I'm too young. I forgot that, you know, this would be the third time. Maybe I'm just a loser. You know, I used to be able to read very well, and now I can't even put put these sentences together in this book. I have no idea what they're talking about. Maybe I just can't get this thing. Instead of all those things coming into my mind, the thought from outside of me came in. And it was, you know what? Those people in AA seem to know what to do. And on the February the 8th, 1976, I went to the meeting that night and I asked the old timers of the meeting the most important question of my life. What do you do to stay sober? There was no conditions or reservations or anything going on in the back of my mind. There's no body language given, yeah, but I don't have that. It was the most, best, the most important question of my entire life. And they knew for the first time I meant business because I gave the body language and the attitude of I mean business. I was surrendered for the very first time. They said, what we do is one day at a time, we don't take the first drink or anything else that affects us from the neck up, and we have a sobriety date. We go to a lot of meetings and we get a home group. We get somebody that we can talk to, and that's a sponsor. We take these steps, and it, we learn to develop a relationship with a God of our own understanding. And while taking them, we get to learn a set of principles that we can apply in all of our affairs. Oh, Deb, you know those traditions, those aren't just for the group. Those are for you to learn how to apply in your personal life. And we try to carry this message and to be of service. 
are they set then and that's still what I try to follow certainly with you know the best of my abilities and with a lot of flaws and I began this journey in Alcoholics Anonymous at that time in Minneapolis my home group was the uh, 12 and 12 group it was a Monday night meeting and my last name was Fegan there my original maiden name and I was active in service, and I uh, uh, it was in meetings or uh, or work. I worked and during the day and went to meetings at night. And it was just full of the spirit. And I moved to Atlanta to shy my fourth birthday. I had leg- I legally changed my name while I was there to a prof- to, to a profession I was interested in getting into. To Richards, my home group was the Skyland group. I was a member of that group till I left. Um, I got a sponsor in that group, Joe P. And um, and I took a four-year cake. And I don't know what, but else, and it goes, click. You know, you're four years sober. You know something now. I have no clue where that came from. Nobody ever gave me that information. But I certainly, you know, I look back at that now and I think, gosh, I barely knew something at 10, let alone four, right? And um, I decided to, uh, you know, seven meetings a week is a lot of meetings. I think I'll trim this back to two or three. And when you're trimming like I do, you, two or three becomes two. Okay, and what happened is that I had this, it was like seven meetings a week was a solid wooden block, but one day at a time with two meetings a week, shaving that down very, very little every single day, so it's very, almost unnoticeable. Two years later at six years of sobriety, it's a small round ball. And I'm wondering at six years of sobriety, 24 years old, why I'm so bored, restless, irritable, and discontented. You see, I failed to look at what I'd stopped doing and I started looking out here for people, places and things to make me happy. Now if you want to get down to the real words of it, it's called men, money and mansions are going to make me happy, okay? I want Tara now. And so I began, uh, I didn't know it, but uh, began to look make this search and three weeks later on a Friday I met little fella and uh, he he met an awful lot of those qualifications and he'd even been sober for 13 years now he hadn't been to a meeting in three years but no problem I'm going to hip him and so I'd learned perseverance here so I'm going to put it to use now perseverance is generally not meant for self-satisfaction but I've kind of forgotten that part and so I'm going to persevere on this little fella. And uh, it was what happened to me is the light switch of insanity got flipped on inside of me. I became terribly, terribly obsessed over self-service, about getting what I want, about another human being. And it just, just went crazy. And over the next few months, I mean, the only thing that saved me is I never quit going to meetings of alcoholics and moms. I didn't want to be there. It was about the last place I wanted to be. Wherever he was is where I wanted to be. And I uh, I had remembered from the very beginning being told that the first time you make the excuse, there may be some debate, some guilt. There won't be when you make the second one. And I was too terrified to end up drunk. And so I went to meetings, but I was no model member. Nobody was sending me newcomers to work with. You know, I was not a model member by any means. I wasn't working the room. I wasn't doing things. I, I, as I said, I, I failed to look at what I had stopped doing. I used to get to my home group meeting an hour before. We still like to do that. Now I'm getting there five minutes before the meeting. I can't give a coffee and sit down. That's all you got time for in five minutes. I'm not giving at all. I'm not working the room. Same with leaving. I used to eat and still am one of the very last people to leave that meeting. Now it's going amen, shake, shake, and you're looking at taillights. I'm out of there. And if you could have heard my mind after that second meeting, it probably have been something like this. Well, I got that done for the week. It was punch in, punch out of meetings. I wasn't given anything back. Just take, take, take and not drinking. And I could say to myself, I'm doing everything they asked me to do, so what's wrong? Oh, I was, I was chipping everything away. And after three months of this whirlwind romance of which I was the only one involved, um, (laughs) I hate those kind. Um, This little fella, he got married to somebody else, and uh, so I let him go. And um, he taught me how to be a good sport here, you know, and uh, 
And I just kind of looked around the rooms, and there's another little fellow very similar in qualification. We did this dance of death for three months, watched him go down the aisle with somebody else, and I was like, okay. I, you know, I really think God said, okay, <laughs> I've had enough amusement out of you. We're going to get you surrendered again. And at six years and nine months of sobriety, it all major came crashing down, major meltdown. And what happens is I, uh, I, Deb, you're an alcoholic. There's only two avenues of relief, drink, which I'd proven to myself does not work for me anymore, or recommit yourself to Alcoholics Anonymous 110%. You know everything that you need to do. It's the end, then some that gives you the cush. And that is the commitment that I make and made and still make, not to impress you, not to show off, not to be braggadocious, not at all. It's because I've needed that extra 10% because I know myself. I know I will shave that 100 down to 99.99 one day at a time, and I need that cush. That little extra keeps me safe. I took the steps again with my sponsor at that time as if I had never taken them before. They felt new. They, 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 it just felt better. It just felt like I'd re, totally recommitted my life. I also made the last amend on that original list, which was to a stepmother, which was the most difficult and the longest one. When they first talked to me about resentments, I don't know what that word means. I know what hate means. I don't know what the word resentment means. And now, you know, evolvement has come on, and I was finally able for the first time at seven years of sobriety to, to have the experience of forgiveness before I made that amend. And that was such a biggie for me. What a great lesson that was. I went on, and I began working more with others, more meetings, sharing, traveling, so forth. Eight and a half years sober, I'm sitting in a meeting thinking, why why can't the enthusiasm just always be there? Because I'm feeling a twinge of restless, irritable, and discontent again. And one more time, because I'm a regular in meetings, I hear my message. And that is that uh, a guide was talking about being sober a number of years, feeling restless, irritable, and discontent. He said, you know, I realized I was trying to live today on last year's program. And I thought, that's what I've been doing. I'm sitting here doing this pats on the back for making that amend that seven years. It's now eight and a half. You know, this is the day that prayer and meditation and all the things that I do count. Yeah, yesterday I learned from it, got me into today. But if I start chipping away at any of these things today, the coasting is never uphill, it's downhill. And so this is the day. It totally changed my thinking about what one day at a time means to me. It's just like this is Saturday night, trying to stay full on Thursday's breakfast. I am very, very hungry by Thursday afternoon, let alone Saturday night. I need fuel every day. I need spiritual fuel every day. And so I began, again, a new way of thinking about what one day at a time means to me. About ten and a half years of sobriety, I got married. I moved to Southern California. My last name there was Harris. Remember the Bellflower Big Book Group, lived in Long Beach. After five years and nine months of marriage, that would come to an end. I was very, very sad, very, very just, you know, just crushed, hurt, humiliated. My ego's involved. I, I just feel like a loser. The whole thing's going on. And I want to share with you, not the event or anything like that, but how you helped me walk through this. It was very ego deflating, of course. And, and I'm 16 and a half years of sobriety. I'm working with the most women I had ever worked with, active on a convention committee, working full time, doing everything that's asked of me. Um, you know, if, if you would have told me better pick up another meeting, it'd have to be at 2 a.m. because I am like maxed out on, on action and activity. And part of me is thinking, you know, isn't isn't there just like some kind of little shield from life's bullets? And, in a, and yes, there and no. Just because I seemingly am doing all the right things and I'm connected and so forth doesn't mean that life won't happen. But what it does mean, there is a shield because instead of falling apart and getting drunk and or, you know, gossiping and bad-mouthing everybody and everything that listen, all these things that were in my life I knew would be the props to hold me up. To help me walk through any difficulty, any loss of any kind, with some dignity and grace. Instead of kicking them, getting rid of sponsees and cutting back on meetings and canceling shares, these are the very things that will keep me propped up. You know, I, the commitments I make for the tomorrows of my life, I don't know what emotional or mental state I'll be in at that time, but I do know I will be at that commitment. And so I walked through that, and in Thanksgiving of that year, we separated in July and in Thanksgiving, 
I, uh, I've been doing pretty good, and for some reason that particular day, Thursday, it just all started coming in. All the self-pity started moving in like a cloud bank. And what's happened, I'm standing up against the wall in that, in that home, and all of a sudden I start to cry. And I just feel the biggest hole in my gut that I ever did before I got sober, sober, and since that day. It just had never felt so devastating, so lonely, so cavernous. And I'll, I started to cry, which turned into sobbing, which turned into sort of hysteria. And the next thing I know, my legs go rubbery, and I'm sliding down that wall. I'm sitting down there, and I'm just just a mess and thinking, okay, you know what, you can let it rip for about another half hour, but then you've got to go get in the shower and get your hair washed and your makeup on and your dress because you have a greeting commitment at the meeting tonight. You see, you've never given me the night off because I might have puffy eyes or didn't feel like smiling at anybody. I knew more than anything that that greeting committee that very day was saving my life, my sanity. I know what it's like to feel so close to the edge of that cliff if anybody just goes, you're over. You're so vulnerable, so delicate. I stayed around the people that I was safest with. And the journey goes on, and I had to look at my part. It's always easy to look at their part, but I had to look at my part, and I realized that I don't know anything about being in a marriage. I don't know about being a partner. I know Zipperino about doing that, and so I need a little self-education. I want to talk to some people who I think have successful relationships, and not that being sober is all about getting the next relationship going on, not by any means to me. But I wanted to be able to have something to bring to the table perhaps one day, if that's what God had in mind. And I dated maybe four people seriously for the next eight years. And uh, for short, short three to nine month periods of time, but every time I tried to improve and do better with with how to be a partner. And finally, when I did meet Kent when in uh, April of 2000, uh, we would, within a very short period of time, knew that each one, we were the right one for the other. And it was, uh, I have never looked back from that weekend. We had dating our first weekend. And, and I at least had something to bring to the table. And I moved up to Northern California, and that's how my name became Davis. And, and, uh, and on our uh, first anniversary in, in um uh, April of 2002, we're back in Atlanta, and, and for both of us, we had various cities and people that we wanted each other to meet that were very important in our lives, and for me, this was the last group for Kent to meet, and we're in Atlanta, and I've been to, we've been to my old home group the night before, and said our prayers that morning, God, please help me stay sober, and we go to this lunch, and this was, was some non, one of the very few non-alcoholic friends I have. And I'd known this man for many, many years, and just because we learned how to talk about things other than program, you know, talk about stuff going on in life and the world, drinking, not drinking, never really became a subject. And so when we sat down for lunch that day, there was a pre-poured goblet of something. And I assumed what it was, but I said to him, what was this? And he said, it's some blah, blah, blah wine. And I said, oh. And I pushed that glass of wine forward out of arm's reach for me. But what I didn't know that day is that it would activate a six-month obsession of being drunk. I did not know how powerful this thing could be despite all that I have done for the prior 26 years. When we left that lunch, I, I said to Kent, God, I just can't believe how that kind of bothered me. I've been around alcohol. All, all my sobriety in various company functions or whatever, it's never bothered me. I've often been asked, would I like something to drink? No, thank you. Never bothered me. I don't know why that day it would. And I just kind of felt it would blow over, and I just, was, again, was so grateful that I had asked God to help me stay sober that day. But it lingered. It lingered, and it was starting to concern me, and I'm starting to take a real fine-tooth comb to my life and take that inventory, and what am I doing wrong that it's staying with me? Why, why is it staking here? It's starting to frighten me because I'm having these conscious movies in my mind of drunkenness, and I don't want to be drunk. I, it's almost as if there's this massive magnet pulling me down the safe white aisle of the grocery store, you know, to the liquor aisle, to drink. And these movies in my mind, these conscious movies, are not of the sparkling crystal glass with a little sip, sip. 
It's the way I used to drink. Get that whiskey bottle, uncap it, pitch the cap because I'll never need it again, and go glug, 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 glug. And that's the last thing I remember until I see Kent. You know, remember how when people would, you were drunk and kind of coming to, and people's mouths are going, but you can't hear anything? That's what I was seeing in this movie, and... I'm in the house is trashed. I've wrecked the car. It's he doesn't know what's happening. The movie played out. The movie played out that I don't get to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous because my ego does not allow that to happen. The movie played out and yet I can't get rid of the thinking. I am praying, begging, asking God. Just just let me know what I need to do to get rid of this. I'm calling my sponsor. I'm concerned about this. What, what am I doing wrong? I'm taking a fine-tooth comb. I'm not doing inappropriate behavior. I'm not lying, stealing, cheating. I am not skipping on commitments, flaking on anything. I'm not being just, I'm not doing anything that I could easily point to and say, hey, 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 you're, you're slipping up here. There wasn't anything. I asked, I asked, I, I don't know what to do, except I am getting terrified of this feeling. And I left a meeting, when, well, not, at, not before it was over. I went to a meeting that morning on a Wednesday, and, as I, and I left when it was over, and I got on the phone to my sponsor. I'm absolutely in tears with terror and fear. I, have, I continue to ask God, please relieve me of the obsession. Please, please, please take this away. And uh, I don't know what more I can do. And uh, I got in the car, and, I, and she had also been going through a lot of things in her life and was not always available by phone. But that day God made her available. And I told her in tears what was going on. I said, I'm actually terrified. And I got in. I, uh, she said, honey, what we have is the disease of alcoholism, not alcoholism. And what it did is it made me feel, okay, I'm not bad. I'm not defective. I have always felt I've had a very strong connection with God. And apparently I did because I stayed sober. I've heard a lot of people talk about this part in their life, but they drank. And I didn't. I fought and fought to stay sober. One day at a time. One hour at a time. Five minutes at a time. And this is 26 plus years sober. I'm not some part-time member who shows up now and then. I'm in the middle of your rooms, these rooms, the middle of your life and my life. I'm showing up for life. I'm not just taking notes here. And it still happened. And it fought to be sober. What happened is that I cried, sat in my car another 20 minutes and just cried and talked to God. It took about a week for that great big thing to just sort of vanish every now and then. It'll have like a meteor. It'll go by my mind. I've had those throughout my sobriety, but it doesn't stay anymore. But I assure you, it wasn't anything that I ever expected. Instead of looking at my life of what am I doing, what am I doing wrong, I flipped that over. Thank God I was doing everything I was doing. What if I'd have been doing something less? What if I had started any of those bad behaviors, skipping meetings, lying, stealing, cheating? What if I'd started any of those things? How weakened I might have been. It is worth the fight to stay sober because I believed it passed. It will pass. It is worth the fight. And I'll tell you, you know, in our third step prayer, it says, take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those I might help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. He helped take away that difficulty. And I hope that by my sharing my story tonight with you, shows the power of God in this program that we have and in my life, the love that I have for this program and whatever it's asked me to do, and what a fantastic way this sober life is. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.